the title of my talk tonight, and I'm going to keep it really focused on uh, uh, on the the lessons, perhaps, is uh, national security in an age of rising Asia, unholy terror, and fiscal crisis. Pretty uh, daunting formula. But I really want to focus on the the half full part of the glass tonight, not the half empty. Those of you who are uh, longtime supporters and newcomers uh, alike to Frank's fantastic organization know well enough the nature and the dangers that we face today, and they are, are certainly severe. We have uh, a, a deterioration of our capability to deter and keep the peace. We have the uh, the, the phenomenon of a China that is exploding in terms of its uh, capabilities and its power and where they're going to fit in the world is, is yet to be determined. And we have a, an Islamist movement that we, I think, very effectively laid out to the world in our 9-11 report that is a new phenomenon. It's worldwide. It's not... Uh, uh, while it's enabled by some, it is not part of any nation state. And they are focused on setting off a weapon of mass destruction to bring down the culture of the free uh, world as, as we know it. These are real threats. We also, as a result of some very inept foreign policy, uh, have uh, uh, really... Uh, grown the problem and the threat of nuclear non-proliferation. Now we've shown that if you give up nuclear weapons like, uh, like Mr. Gaddafi and, uh, and uh, uh, President Mubarak, that uh, you can be out like that. But if you defy the United States and the world community and pursue nuclear weapons like North Korea and Iran and Syria, you are immune from even being asked to resign by the United States and the United Nations. So these are the three major uh, areas of threat that we as a nation and our institutions face today, and I'm not going to dwell on, uh, on the ramifications of them. I want to dwell on the solutions to these issues, the solutions to these problems, because they're very solvable in the sense of we can provide for our national security in this very threatening age with new kinds of, of threats. And I, I, I want to uh, dwell on, as I said, the half full part of the glass uh, uh, here tonight. Most recently, we showed that we do have a capability and indeed uh, a, a national will uh, to defend our interests with the dramatic uh, uh, bringing to justice, as was said, of Osama bin Laden. We have enormous capabilities. We have the ability to project power anywhere uh, in, in the world. We have the capability to demonstrate to the Chinese, for instance, that we are able to maintain a balance, that we are not inevitably in decline. But we have not really been taking advantage of the inherent capability we have. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, why that, that is the case. We clearly have been unilaterally disarming our services uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, our fleet is less than half the size, even though we've been spending in constant dollar terms almost twice as much in adjusted for inflation as President Reagan spent. The Air Force's a average age of the uh, Air Force's fleet of aircraft is 28 years. And they have half the number of combat airplanes that they had at the height of the Reagan administration. The world hasn't gotten any smaller. The threats, while very different than the Cold War confrontation, are much more complex, much more varied, and much more disparate and less able to be 
dealt with by the kind of static and uh, ordered forces that we were used to in the Cold War. So we've been steadily reducing our capability to act around the world, and we've been doing it even while increasing the defense budget. And this is why I, I argue all the time with my conservative friends who are constantly campaigning for increasing the defense budget. The answer is we've got to have more money given to defense to, to provide for this deterrent. We're fighting now three wars, and yet we're talking about cutting the defense budget. But the real nature of our unilateral disarmament is something very different. We face a crisis of, to put it very simply, bureaucratic bloat. It afflicts our intelligence community. It afflicts every one of our military services. And most importantly, it afflicts our Defense Department. Now just to throw a few, uh, a few factoids your way from our recent, uh, uh, recent commission report, when the Department of Defense was set up in 1947, the law limited it to 50 civilian staffers for the Secretary of Defense, which at the time was larger than the White House staff. Today, there are 750,000 civilian staff members of the Department of Defense. And every time there is a crisis that the media focuses on in defense procurement, Congress reacts by creating a new layer of bureaucracy. Last year alone, they added 20,000 new civil service slots to the Pentagon because they, the argument was we have to reform defense procurement. Now, the whole Pentagon only holds 25,000 people. And with one trace, they added another 20,000. That's 750 now added to by 20,000. And the problem is that this bloat has afflicted every part of defense procurement. So the F-22 had to be stopped at 187 airplanes uh, when it was supposed to have 700. And the reason was the price had gone up to $350 million a copy. And that wasn't because the contractors were gouging or the services were gold plating. It was because the program took 24 years from the time it was started until the first squadron deployed to Japan. And time is money. And the reason it took 24 years was that there are now 40 requirements committees that have to approve every single action taken on a major ACAT 1 or 2 uh, program. All of these 750,000 bureaucrats have to have things to do. It is exactly the same thing in the Navy Department, for example. In World War II, we built 1,000 ships a year. At the time, the Bureau of Ships, which is in charge of building ships, had 1,000 bureaucrats, 1,000. Most of them were graduate engineers, graduates of MIT, members of, uh, of the uh, uh, engineering duty officer corps, elites. When I was secretary and ACE was running the Pacific Fleet, it had grown to 4,000 people, and we were building 28 ships a year, not 1,000 ships a year. Today, we've been averaging five ships a year of the ships that ACE was a little derisive of, shall we say, <laughs> rather than battleships or carriers. And the bureaucracy of Bu ships, now called NAVC, is 25,000 bureaucrats, 25,000 bureaucrats. So I won't dwell too much on this because I said I was going to talk about the half full part of the glass. 
<laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, the intelligence community suffers exactly the same bloat. And in the 9-11 Commission, we recommended that we create a director of national intelligence to break down this bureaucracy, to cut it, to reduce it, to break down the layers, to tear down the stovepipe so information could be shared. It's far too bloated, too many bureaucrats, 15 different agencies. Well, unfortunately, instead, while Congress did what, what the commission asked and passed the law, the Bush administration turned it on its head and created a DNI without the powers to cut and gave, them, gave him a staff of 2,000 additional bureaucrats. That's beyond belief. Well, now to the full part of the glass. The fact is that all it takes is leadership to reverse this, and it can be reversed in a short period of time. Most of you are New Yorkers here. When I moved to New York in 1988, it, it really was a a, a cesspool of a city. It was filthy, it was, it was disgusting. It was filthy, people, the trash wasn't collected on time, you couldn't walk down uh, for a half an hour into Midtown without seeing a, 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 a robbery or something. Squeegee bums on every uh, major corner. And then suddenly we had a leader was elected. And within three months, the squeegee bums were gone. The trash started to get collected. The streets were starting to be cleaned. The taxis were forced to turn on air conditioners. The city was transformed. At that time, New York had twice the uh, uh, crime rate of London. Today, the streets are clean, the subways work, the taxis are air conditioned. No squeegee bums. The crime rate is 40% less than London today. Everybody said New York is ungovernable. That's just the way it is. You know, it's, it's always been that way. Well, it's not true. And in the 9-11 Commission, we pointed out that every bit of intelligence showed that New York was the epicenter of the targeting of Al-Qaeda and every other Islamist group, and that we did not have in New York anything approaching the kind of command and control or communications that could deal with that threat, as demonstrated by the inability of the cops to talk to the firemen and, the, and all of the casualties that resulted. Well, today, I'm pleased to tell you that New York, in my judgment, and all of the other 9-11 people, is the safest city in the world because of leadership. Ray Kelly, and two fine mayors. They led the country, and the country, most of the municipalities have tried to emulate New York. Now the cops are put in charge of the command centers in any crisis. Now the cops have the most sophisticated military communications to talk under any circumstances, in tunnels, on subways to all of the uh, to to all of the other first responders and the authorities we have the best in new york uh, counterterrorism center in the world if i were president i'd be briefed by ray kelly's counterterrorism center they have the best absolutely the best everybody said it couldn't be done it was done and it was done fast by leadership Ace Lyons, as I said, should have been the awardee tonight because everybody said when Reagan came in, all of the Mossback admirals and the trendy OSD uh, intellectuals and the people on the hill said, you can't take the fleet north of the GIUK cap. You can't survive up there. NATO's official doctrine said the fleet will get decimated within days by the, by the Russian fleet. Ace Lyons, who had second fleet, said, oh, yes, we can, and I'll show you how to do it. And he took five carriers up there in September of 1981, and he kicked the Soviets' ass from one side of the Norwegian Sea to the other. And the reason we know this, 
still some classified sources that we can't talk about, but three years ago, I was invited to, uh, 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 to Norway for a conference with my counterparts from the Russian uh, High Command to talk about the Reagan strategy, a forward strategy, of practicing going up there every year, showing we could not only survive, but we could run mock attacks against the Soviet Union, the White Sea. We did the same thing on the Northern Pacific. And these Russians said that their own uh, wargaming and ops analysis showed that the longest their fleet ever survived against ACE and his successors in these annual exercises was one week, and the entire fleet was gone. This is from the Russians. This is from the Russians. <laughs> and it was the input of these, of these uh, general staff people who went in 1986 back with a major uh, uh, position to the Politburo that they had to triple the budget for defenses in the northern flank or the Soviet Union would lose the war. And it was that that had, we now know from other intelligence sources, had a thunderclap impact on the leadership that eventually started Glasnost and, and so forth. So I'm here to tell you that the problems we face today are very solvable. All it takes is a recognition of the problem and leadership. 750,000 bureaucrats are not needed. 9% a year is the attrition rate uh, in the bureaucracy. So even a selective hiring freeze, not a total hiring freeze, but a selective hiring freeze would shrink this bureaucracy down uh, to a manageable size within four years. Plus you have early retirements, plus you have plenty of other tools that are available that could get back to the, the fine people that are in there that are in, want to get these things done. So that's my message. Yes, we are in a serious threat situation today. But yes, we have the resources to turn this around and reassert American primacy as a defender of the free world. And all it takes, all it takes is leadership. So on that note, um, uh, I would like to thank you. I'm deeply honored for this, uh, receiving this award, Frank. And uh, uh, keep up what you're doing because you've done more to uh, really articulate and get across uh, to the leadership of this country the nature of this threat than anyone else I know. Thank you. John, thank you for that uh, treatment of the glass in several different phases, <laughs> running from uh, from empty to uh, to definitely half full at the very least. And and most especially, thank you for the leadership that you and Ace Lyons and of course Miles Prentice have been exhibiting. Uh, it's why we're here uh, to celebrate you. It's why we're doing what we do at the center day in and day out. I appreciate uh, more than I can say your your high commendation at the end.